Salutations, my Shadow Realm horrors. It's Man Sant, and I'm just back from Tokyo, and I really, really, really wanted to jump in and put out a deck tech for the new Leviathan card, but I just didn't have a fully cooked list yet. I've been slamming my head against the wall trying to build something that I 100% stand by just because I wasn't totally happy with the heavy hitters deck deck that I put out. A lot of that was just theory instead of actual games played. And so we've got a list that I've got about 30 games played with so far that I'm pretty close to happy with and I wanted to go ahead and share some of the testing against all the new heroes Enigma, New, and Zen with some games that I captured just a little bit earlier. I promise I did not actually cherry pick these. I don't have a lot of time right now so I just sat down recorded three and I'm just going to talk over them as they go. Uh, you'll see whether they're wins or losses here but uh, I'll go ahead and share the deck list that I'm jamming on in the description but the fully released and articulated deck list will probably have to wait until about Monday or so. The reality reality is I just don't have any of the decks sleeved up right now. It's already past midnight, uh, and uh, there's also some big announcements coming with these fantastic Might Cold Foil and Agility Cold Foil tokens that I just want to make sure I have enough time to properly uh, edit and put the effort in. So with that, enjoy the games, and you'll see the full deck tech early next week. <laughs> All right, hey everyone, this is going to be a run through of a game versus each of the new heroes, starting off with Enigma. And uh, if you look in the deck list, I mean, I'm sure it's going to get diluted with a lot of people clicking and copy and pasting. But I have about 30 games right now, and Enigma is the one that I've played the least in terms of priority of practicing matchups. New was the hardest, in my opinion, so I've been putting more games into her. But every time an Enigma crops up, uh, the games actually seem pretty easy. I think the, the main thing that's happening when you sit down and against Enigma uh, is you're basically up against your own deck uh, more than anything because Enigma is not interacting with you. Uh, she is every once in a while kind of forcing your hand with scab skins just because uh, interacting with like a double spectra board can be important. But otherwise, you are just left to your own devices in actually playing out the game. So you're trying to just push your deck to be consistent and to constantly put pressure on the Enigma, and if it doesn't do that, then you just fall behind and the board state gets to a point where you lose. But I wouldn't really put that on the Enigma. It's really more so your own deck. Can your own deck play through Enigma's tankiness? And if you've put any uh, decent amount of time into playing Leviathan, you should be pretty used to beating these kinds of decks. I think they're, more than anything, the easiest matchups for Leviathan because you're just given a uh, you know fresh canvas right and you are just going to paint a very uh, demonic picture right you're just gonna slap on a little eclipse in the background start drawing a Blasma fet s creature and there you go you've got a shadow realm horror that is just winning you the game so the enigma matchup kind of goes like that you are really playing your own deck to its strengths and uh, to talk a little bit about the equipment and the thoughts going into this matchup before we get to the more intricate plays because this is this is kind of just like an early game sequence right now you can see the shadow realm horror uh there was a guaranteed banish on uh the three six three sixes because the wrecker romp discarded a six we just got to block with one uh so this is a pretty early shadow realm horror that actually is guaranteed to not even put me into blood debt because the only card that has blood debt i am guaranteed to play out which is the slithering so um with this extra yellow in hand i'm not trying to miss value i do end up rolling scab skins which you can see in a second uh, just because it's a yellow in hand it might as well convert to three damage uh, unfortunately it is a one so we hit the reroll button but th this isn't a matchup where you know you need scab skins for als Right, like Arclight Sentinel uh, is not something that can just short your Blood Rush turn. You're really just running Scabskins and Gamblers to help clear the board. So if you have to break your Gamblers early just to make sure that you're still threatening damage, it's about the same as if you're clearing the board anyway. You're just keeping up the pressure. So that's the choice on, on the break there. Uh, and you can still have opportunities to roll Scabskins after Blood Hits off with like an Art of War, a Shadow Realm Horror, or a Dread Screamer. But anyway, let's talk about the list overall right now uh, you can see i'm running spoiled skull and savage sash along with gamblers which are already gone and scabskins uh, so basically all four of these pieces are sideboard equipment right now uh, the 
The most common leg piece I've been running is actually Hooves of the Shadow Realm right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next two matchups, I'm sure. Uh, so all four of these equipment are actually sideboard pieces, but they're there for good reason. And that's really because Spoiled Skull guarantees you uh, to basically pull a go again from your Banished Sun. You can do that by calling Blood Rush, Dread Screamer, and Shadow Realm Horror, and basically guarantee that you turn your hand into a go wide hand, obviously Blood Rush being kind of the best hit there, but you no longer need to add in a Pulping or a Wild Ride to get the Spoiled Skull value like we used to versus Dromai, because now we have the Shadow Realm Horror uh, that is doing kind of our, our you know, it's our ideal third option, if not our second option, because it's a little bit better than Dread in a lot of cases. So Spoiled Skull is just a card advantage piece, and since we're not worried about on hits, it is just keeping up pressure, guaranteeing we chain together uh, these larger, higher pressure hands. And then we have Savage Sash, and this is a chess piece I actually don't own in person yet. It's actually one of the reasons I'm waiting to do the deck tech. Uh, I don't want to show a proxy. I'm all about that bling, you know? So I need to go meet up with someone this weekend who has a Savage Sash so I can trade for it. Uh, I was not able to get any KO decks anywhere near me, and I forgot to buy one in Tokyo, where they were actually MSRP, unlike around me now. So my bad. But there we go, we're running Savage Sash. Uh, this actually does just help insulate a little bit um, for, uh, I guess, like some of the light on hits that you can run into. Enigmas right now don't really seem to run much, but like CNC is a thing, right? So having uh, the temper piece in Scab Skins, temper piece in Savage Sash, at some point you probably give a card plus like the armor block and boom, that does cover you up from a hit effect. So um, in it's actually got its use there versus like what Tunic would do um, because Tunic wouldn't really help in blocking out a CNC with this similar loadout. Uh, so you're going to block with it once and then you're also going to crack it at some point in this game. And my goodness, Savage Sash does have its ceilings in Leviah. It's not quite the same as an on-demand blood rush as easy as parking a like draw discard in Arsenal, uh, but it can get you to four wide blood rushes quite easily. Uh, sometimes if you put like the Dread Screamer in Arsenal, you're given a four card hand and you just slam Blood Rush, uh, you can be shorted somewhere, maybe it's the resource space, uh, to really get that four wide Blood Rush going, but saving two resources from Savage Sash alone is so insanely good. And I think more than anything, you want to use Savage Sash in those situations where it is like this fifth or sixth card in your hand that's really unlocking something uh, or saving you off the back of some of these uh, like low roll draws if you draw into a lot of reds savage sash can also help you there because in theory you're not wasting those reds you're not pitching them away inefficiently you now get to keep one and put that in arsenal so when savage Fa sash unlocks this larger than hand it is quite quite good um, i'm still testing it in more matchups to see exactly where I want to run it across the board, uh, but it is definitely very strong in this matchup. I would absolutely run it. And then finally we have Scabs, Gamblers, which we already talked about a little bit. So there we go. That is the run through of the equipment that we're thinking about here. Um, the other bits of sideboard that make this deck different uh, in a similar vein to some of the more recent Leviah list. I'm not swapping around too many cards right now. I think the core of Leviah is very tight now more than ever. Um, simply because of Shadow Realm Horror needing the deck to be built in a very specific way. The sixes really, really need to be core of your deck, whereas in Leviash you could sometimes get away with like around 35 on the low end. Right now I'm looking at 40 minimum, realistically, to, to kind of start these Shadow Realm Horror builds off. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, what that means with sideboarding is I'm only really putting in one tech recursion piece of choice, which for this matchup is Howl from Beyond, and then a couple yellows that help smooth out what the game plan is. Um, and in this matchup, it is the Shaden Death Hydra. Some of the other choices that we get in those slots, and we're going to talk about this more during the actual deck tech, but it would be um, like Smashing Performance, uh, Anti-Tech, Anti-Kano, uh, Send Packing, which is like your Anti-Aggro include. Um, so with that, with that, let us now focus on the game. We're kind of into the more difficult Levi decisions, uh, which is the best time to really get into the nitty gritty here. Hopefully we can teach some people some things. So right now you see me go for this Endless Maw play, uh, which I think for the layman Leviah player looks very scary to leave the graveyard at this singular state. Uh, you're only going to have that one card, Endless Maw, in the graveyard at the end of this turn, but there's a couple things to note. Number one is Hal from Beyond is this on-demand graveyard fill that we now have as a recursion piece. 
That's number one. Number two, we have Savage Sash uh, to also instantly crack and fill Graveyard. So we actually can get to three in Graveyard if we really need to on this next turn cycle. But the other thing to think about is always the Ghost stack in Leviah. Think about what cards you haven't seen yet because so many of Leviah's cards do very specific and very powerful things. So if you've seen a first cycle that, or rather if you're seeing the beginning of a first cycle that is really low on Art of Wars, but Art of War in particular can kind of get you ahead on graveyard fill in a state like this, then you can start to make plays that are not necessarily Art of War or Bust. You know, we do have that safety net of Savage Sash, but you're putting more uh, points into naturally drawing out of these hands because you just haven't seen Art of War yet to begin with. Uh, and Art of War, especially with a Graveling Ground and Arsenal, is the perfect draw for this kind of scenario because uh, it's not going to tax your graveyard basically at all. You're going to play Art of War, and then one of the attacks that uh, you are throwing on an Art of War turn is the Graveling Growl, which also doesn't banish. So we were perfectly set up for an Art of War turn, but also ready to slam it uh, at least with Savage Sash, uh, if not like maybe Agile Windup, Smash Back, Alehorn. There's a lot of cards that could have instantly filled it. We do end up getting basically the ceiling of a, uh, you know, four up like four card draw in this instance. You know, a Blood Rush is always perfect to rip, and when you have one card in Graveyard, that's good to go. This is really interesting though, because uh, we start with a yellow pitch, and normally in a blood rush state, um, you wouldn't be happy to do this, especially with a arsenal that doesn't turn off blood debt. Like an arsenal, if the arsenal is a boneyard marauder here, then everything we're doing looks quite nice pre sash. But now we have savage sash available to us, and like I talked about enabling this like kind of fifth or sixth card in hand. We ended up drawing all yellows, which is not awful for Leviah in general and how she can like play through these Blood Rush hands, but for the specific scenario that we were ready for, drawing yellows didn't actually uh, unlock this hand's full potential if we at minimum wanted to three throw a three wide Blood Rush. So now we have to look at how do we still get max value here? And lucky enough, we have Savage Sash to make Dread Screamer cost one and then Graveling Growl cost zero. So off the back of no blues, no blues for this Blood Rush play, we can Savage Sash and still throw a four wide Blood Rush turn for 26 damage. Uh, not only that, but once again, we're getting a head on Graveyard Fill because uh, the Dread Screamer, sure, it's gonna banish three, but we're gonna leave the Graveyard with the Savage Sash and the Graveling Growl. So we will end this turn with three cards in Graveyard still, not to mention that the Hell from Beyond is also letting us instantly refill uh, when we want to. So this is just massive. The ability for Savage Sash, uh, not just to bail a three wide play, but to actually enable a four wide play in first cycle is just insane. And once again, not a single blue needed. Not a single blue needed for this kind of play. So uh, yeah, it's just the momentum that we need here. Uh, you can see the, the Enigma player hasn't really had too much of an oppressive board state this entire game, but that's really because we have not missed a beat on the Leviathan side into also just putting on non-stop pressure. And with Spoiled Skull, with Savage Sash, and with Scabskin Leathers, it's gonna take some really, really abysmal play or just luck to not have pressure uh, in this kind of matchup. If you don't put your arsenal uh, kind of in a, in a position to continuous, continuously apply pressure, then sure, a four card draw might not give you uh, the results you're looking for, but Levi is always about cycling in an arsenal card that could potentially enable the next hand. So we're gonna try to you know juggle that, we're trying to juggle the graveyard state, uh, and also just juggle applying enough pressure turn by turn to not get behind on some uh, you know manifestation of Miragai or something oppressive that the Enigma can protect uh, and then get some really disgusting value out of. But the good news is even if Enigma sticks something like that, it's just raw damage at the end of the day. And we have effectively 35 life at this point, right? 32 plus the scabs block three uh, to just use that life as a resource, let the Enigma try to fight for her board, let the Enigma swing that back into us, but we are now giving ourselves probably um, 
a good like six turns or so of taking Enigma's attacks for us to find opportunity to go above her blocks and clear the board continuously. So we really have just so much room, so much room to play this game still. Uh, so that that's something that I really feel like the Enigmas struggle with. Um, just, you know, life as a resource for Levia is something that uh, we can just use so potently uh, because if we are looking to keep a full grip. Uh, it's normally not because it's a bad rate, right? We're keeping a full grip because we've got some enabler play uh, and we just get so many opportunities to say that into Enigma that we just like don't really mind what she's doing. Um, and so this is a turn where we're basically breaking the, the standard kind of math cycle where we are spending three cards right now to throw 13. Three cards for 13, that's above rate, and we're arsenaling another go wide piece. So to kind of get ourselves in this loop is really, really important because the last turn wasn't great for that. The last turn definitely had us, uh, you know, pitch awkwardly and that is going to come up, right? One of the things that I mentioned is that you're going to lose this matchup if your deck just doesn't cooperate uh, over at least like three quarters of the game. If your deck's cooperating three quarters of the game, you are going to win this matchup hands down. If your deck's only cooperating like half the time, I would say maybe tweak the deck list a little bit uh, or rethink how you're using equipment or your arsenal because those are definitely going to change the game. Uh, but right now, this is this is exactly where we want to be. We've only really had that one stumble turn. It still went uh, you know, above rate. The, our last turn was still dread into red graveling. It just put us off arsenal when you know, rate wise, we probably could have, you know, we would have been able to do that if we just drawn a blue. But now we come back. We get that opportunity back because Levi is constantly pushing three card hands above rate and when your opponent's on the defensive that opens you up to sometimes block with that fourth card sometimes arsenal that fourth card and then continue on this barrage of pressure so uh we made the choice there just because uh it is hard to know especially with a blue dread screamer and arsenal whether or not you can realistically end the game in like the next maybe three turns is like what I'm thinking of in this situation. A blue dread screamer in arsenal means my next turn definitely doesn't kill Enigma. My next turn is probably too wide. Um, not, you know, it's going to make her block. It's going to present lethal, but it's not going to kill her. My next turn is probably also going to be a little bit slower. I'm going to put something new in arsenal, but then my third turn will be where I likely do kill the Enigma is what I'm thinking about in my head here. So uh, with that, the haze bending probably could go. Because if this turn isn't that strong, and then my next turn is where I like reset Arsenal, I'm potentially giving Enigma um, an extra two life at minimum out of that uh, haze bending from like her playing wards uh, and then them breaking. And that's only honestly that's like very similar to like what ended up happening because I, I throw Claw at it that clears it. It does create a new spectral and in theory like soaked up three damage. So in a way, I let it have four damage when I knew it would like at minimum get two. It's also just a little bit of a hedge of that maybe I don't end the game in three turns uh, and then that does spiral a little bit, but it is close. It's like guaranteed four value for the Enigma if I clear Haze Bending there. Uh, whereas if I don't clear it, I'm like basically guaranteeing two value out of it. But if I can't end the game, if something drastic happens, then it is protection over the future. So interesting choice, I think in tournament, I do always clear it. I think in casual play, I let it go just to kind of see if my theory is correct. Uh, but anyway, we're in another interesting spot here because like I said, the blue dread screamer goes face, right? It actually, unfortunately, uh, doesn't hit the howl from beyond. So I don't even, uh, I don't even get that recursive loop in play. And what that also means is my graveyard has two misses in it right now. And like I said about potentially losing the game, one of the ways you potentially lose is if you get a little bit lazy about your blood debt. So we don't want to do that. Even though the face-up play looks like just slam Doomsday, Doomsday would leave us with three misses in the graveyard and no sixes. Like literally three cards in the graveyard and none of them are sixes, right? It lets us stick Blasma Fett, but our arsenal wouldn't even be a go again card to make sure that Blasma Fett is getting good value out of the next turn anyway. So it looks like a value play, but we actually don't need Blasma Fett 
to win in this position. What we need to win is to not punt our arsenal. So we instead go for the Deadwood Rumbler uh, as a way to get extra cards in Graveyard, guaranteeing that at least one of them is a six, and then potentially uh, getting a little lucky on the draw discard also being a six, which we did, and then get to cycle in a new card, which uh, happens to be a Blue Dread Screamer. So I really like how we played that last turn out. Uh, we're now in a similar situation of the deck not entirely cooperating. We're a little clunked for resources here, uh, but it doesn't mean we can't play the game uh, because this hand, right, it, it still throws too wide and still gets us ahead on Arsenal. Uh, none of these rates look good, mind you. None of these rates look good. We're coming in with a Blue Dread Screamer, an effective two card four, and then we can come in with the Slithering Shadowpeed, a two card six. So pretty trash rates but the way to kind of fight back and get good rate would have been to block but we actually don't need to block at all in this position all that was coming in was a miraging metamorph and we actually don't even want to pop that because they get extra value off of copying the auras in play so we just let we just let it hit us life as a resource right life as a resource and now we put our graveyard in a very similar position to how we've had it most of the game which is the on-demand howl will fix this graveyard for us one of the cards is guaranteed a six in this case the slithering shadow bead and we're just in control of the graveyard if we're in control of the graveyard we are in control of the game that's what we need to think about we're also putting endless mon arsenal which is another really, really strong way to cycle a three card 12 into a stronger arsenal. Uh, so if we draw like a yellow and a blue, then guaranteed that's 12 damage without needing to block at all. And then we can arsenal uh, a stronger card potentially it is what this hand um, initially reads as. So that's really, really good in this kind of position, right? Like 12 has to get an answer out of the Enigma, uh, but there's other opportunities available to us obviously now uh, because the way we drop this hand now lets us know it is Blood Rush playable. Uh, so Blood Rush leading yellow, not super strong, not super strong, especially knowing that we have a three cost in our arsenal. We need to get a little lucky on the draws here uh, to still do what we want to do. Uh, we need to draw two resource cards basically to at least go claw into Endless Maw. I do feel like that was pretty likely um, considering like where we are in the deck anyway. Uh, we have, we've been like red clumped twice and the deck right now is 20, 20, 20 in terms of 20 red, 20 yellow, 20 blue. So being red clumped twice, but not being like and only being a yellow clumped once, but never blue clumped, means that, um, yeah, resource cards at this point in the game felt likely. Uh, so we went with that play, and then sure enough, do get to go claw into Endless Maw. If we discarded the Graveling Growl and kept the Agile Windup, we could have fit in the extra claw here, but, um, you know, we're not going to complain about it. We're not going to complain about it. This is still uh, a wildly successful turn for us, and uh, the fact that they had to pitch into Oasis means they basically die on this turn. Uh, yep, sure enough, that is it. Uh, I also, I forgot to click and look at the decks when I was recording that one, so I do apologize. It is fun to go back and look at the stats a little bit more, but I didn't in this case. Now we're playing against a new, and uh, new is, oh, man, it is a tough game. It is a tough game, but it is not an impossible game. I initially was playing Leviah uh, almost without, um, uh, w without being like too meticulous about it, just like slamming hands like trying to see if on a matchup axis i could kind of just ignore new uh and play the game and the reality is you can't do that ignoring new completely does put you in a losing position as the leviah player because if you ignore new then you don't really get to um uh i mean you just don't inherently get to play leviah's game plan of like oh uh this hand wants me to block so i guess i'll throw them a card somewhere uh because you can't always do that turn by turn like new just doesn't let you do that every turn because sometimes you know they've got only stealth cards as their attack and then you just can't block that card so you do have to think about what new is doing continuously as leviah and play around um basically like what their pumps could be more than anything that is the issue into new and i think as the lists get more refined it will be easier to know what their uh pumps are because as of now i've run into some pretty wild news some are running like spikes some are running like only hiss and slithers some are running the um the majestic that like makes you block uh from hand i hate that one sometimes you've seen like a gorgon's gaze like the news are kind of all over the place with their reactions right now so it is tough to do like the soul reads on on new but more than anything just you know remember pick to pieces specifically and the fact that they can pump four pretty easily so they can pump five and they can pump four 
kind of as like the tallest they'll go card per card, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, but uh, if it's like raw damage that you're looking at more than anything, like this pick to pieces, you just shouldn't worry about it too much. And whether it's, you know, if they've got the good damage in hand, like just c'est la vie, let them ship it and worry more about uh, the ones that are going to interact with you. So the Mask of Recurring Nightmares is another card that you'll actually see in this game in particular, I'm constantly thinking about because this was another piece of kind of my initial testing into new, where I was just ignoring new and just trying to play the Levi game plan. The problem with that is you would fall into these positions where Mask of Recurring Nightmares just said, you can't ignore me, you can't ignore me, uh, and just absolutely tank the decisions you're trying to make turn by turn. Uh, so that card really does affect how you block, and you almost have to get a little lucky with them wanting to play it on a turn where like their only attack was stealth, and you don't really want to block stealth anyway, which does happen more often than not, simply because a lot of their stealth cards are blue, and that's how they're going to even transcend to activate Mask of Recurring Nightmares. So I don't, I don't think it's like ultimately that lucky that you get those opportunities. It's more so something you just need to expect with how they're going to play their hand. Uh, so uh, we unfortunately do like IP ourselves on that early Blood Rush. Um, we hit it off a of Beast Within. So uh, in the end, like still getting three card 18. It's like pretty gross, or actually 19, because it was a Gravely Girl. That's still pretty gross. Um, but in theory, the value could have been even higher if we just like didn't have an arsenal yet. We could have arsenaled the last card, and that would have been pretty sick. Um, but there was actually one of the Soul Read scenarios where um, our hand was uh, kind of a forced hooves if we wanted to play it. And uh, hooves early actually does fill the graveyard anyway, so it's not awful to need to play it out that way. Uh, especially into new at a certain point like if you can just get ahead on graveyard if you can somehow have just like played an early game whether it's like the art of wars the blood rush is like cracking armor early if you can just like play early to get your graveyard in a good spot it does save you tons in having to make those tough to tough decisions later uh, so a graveyard state like this I actually uh, you know quite quite love already uh, so there we go we are now playing a pretty simple 3 card 12, and the beauty of chaining these like Gravelings or Diabolic Offerings in this case as the second attack rather than the Boneyard Marauder uh, is just, you know, we don't tax the Graveyard. We're actually leaving it in a pretty good spot, and then Arsling the Boneyard is just incredibly strong in Blood Rush draws or just making sure that we turn off Blood Debt on the next turn anyway. So we're in a very good rhythm for the game to be, and it's really all off the back of a Hedge Block. Uh, over um, the... Uh, I forgot what the card was, but we basically blocked six, uh, calling them on their pick to pieces. Um, it it can definitely get worse than that because the arousing wave is pretty hard to play around. And let me tell you folks, uh, the fact that arousing wave can target CNC is ridiculous. That feels so horrible time and time again that actually situations like this are the perfect situ are, are just perfect to try to bait out a rousing wave. This is like such a good arousing wave for them. It's so obvious for them that I just want them to do it. Like, please, for the love of God, just a rousing wave here so that I don't have to worry about it when you are holding like more information above me, right? That's when it gets really hard to think about what all their options can be. But if a rousing wave is off the table just because it looks so juicy, like, oh, they got my arsenal clear, great. But the reality is I just had another, um, I just had a, a new card that I wanted in Arsenal anyway. So them pumping the Leave No Witnesses in the end just helps me. I would have like IP'd myself if, uh, intellect penalty, I would have like kept a card I couldn't use uh, if they didn't use the arousing wave there. So you're not going to get that situation every game, but that is something that you have to like kind of let them have at one point in the game. Uh, I'm pretty sure, as, as far as all the games I've played against them, whether it's on like a Leave No Witnesses or on a CNC, I just kind of like want them to do it, but I don't want to be in a position where like if they do it, I lose. Uh, if you're in a position where if they do it, you lose, then you've got armor that you can just like pretty face up overblock with. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is one of the more frustrating things against New. It's just like how long do they have a rousing wave around? Um, speaking of frustrating things, this is a Shadow Blasphemy play that misses. There actually is an argument to just have never discarded the Agile Windup so that I would have had more chances on the discard. Uh, and then in that case, if I just like had 
not ended up discarding it. I could have just discarded it on the Shadow Blast Vet turn, pulled the agility into next turn, still would have been fine. But I was feeling good. I was feeling I was feeling the greed on that one and uh, hoping that we could get the Shadow Blazafet banish into the Graveling Growl and just have like another three card 12 play uh, for us. But it did not happen. It did not happen. And in fact, I got punished and in a way helped the new equalize the game here. Uh, you know, I took nine blood debt <laughs> that last turn cycle and the game actually still looks pretty good, uh, which is which is pretty funny uh, considering how this game is. Uh, uh, how this matchup like can go, right? I don't think the new really has done anything wrong. We made a couple good decisions around the Mask of Recurring Nightmares for sure, uh, and then we made a hedge block that was also uh, pretty pretty strong. Uh, and the new is you know putting us in spots like this. Like, look, they they're abusing the fact that we used our armor early, and now the block on Leave No Witnesses actually takes two cards, which just makes Codex of Frailty look ridiculous. Codex of Frailty there just destroyed my Blood Rush turn. It turned my Blood Rush turn into an Endless Maw for 8, which is... I mean, we're not going to complain about that. That is still a 2-card 8. And actually, we'll, we'll note this now. I'm not running Swing Big in the list, so uh, we'll talk more about that at length when I put the full deck tech out. Uh, so 8 is not a number you see all that often anymore, but there it is, 8, coming from a frailty Endless Maw right here. Uh, not something the new needs to respectfully. They can say no blocks in this if they want, but we are at 18 and even with a handful of reactions, we're not at risk of death from 18 and we're also very, very close to flipping into redeemed, which in this matchup, I go redeemed like nine times out of 10, truly. I go consumed basically if it's an accident uh, but as a game plan, they absolutely fatigue you through consumed. It's not close. Uh, the whole like turbo stack where you, you know, like play three turns, um, uh, like, or not even three turns, but you've like got your blue stacked in a good way. Uh, take, you know, 12 blood debt with consumed, try to flip into the shade and play with all your blue stacked up exactly how you want and end the game is very, very hard to do against new because they're so disruptive. And a lot of like these end game hands with Levia do need to protect some very specific cards if you're going for that like turbo uh, blood debt strat as consumed. But the problem there is you only really get one or two turns to try to pull off that kill turn, whether it's like Convulsions, Hydra, some tear limb from limb play. And if the new disrupts you on that hand, then you lose because now your deck is gone and you just don't get another shot to do that. So I have had very, very little success in trying to play for like the turbo blood debt into end game blue stack consumed and instead grinding for value into redeemed at some point in the game to kind of make them struggle to close has been a lot more successful for me because redeemed in a way helps you be a little bit more impervious to their disruption as well because now you don't need to turn off blood debt. Uh, so you can kind of sequence your redeem flipped in a way where uh, it gives you like one extra turn where you don't really need to worry about their disruption losing you the game uh, and you can stabilize with like a strong two card hand that you put in arsenal or something like that uh, and remember like this is ideal scenarios right like if you're wildly behind and flip redeemed it's not a comeback mechanic you probably still just lose but if the game is pretty even which i feel like a lot of new games end up being even and then you flip redeemed that's where you get ahead and that's where it feels really good. If you are wildly behind against new, good luck. Pack it up. You are probably not winning that game. It is very, very hard to come back uh, because even if the new draws these like full grips of blues, she can at least convert them into damage somewhere with like the beckoning misblades or maybe make you panic into uh, blocking in a way that wasn't ideal just because you think it's reactions when in reality it's blues that she's going to use with go again. She's just like not very fun to play against with a full grip. So I would much rather when we're playing kind of back and forth and trading for value that we get a little bit more of a read turn by turn because she is blocking a card here or something like that. If we ever just kind of give up, give them a full card, uh, a full grip because we have to, uh, you know, just kind of concede to their disruption, flip redeemed or something, they are still going to do something horrible with that full grip. So I much prefer when the game is even more back and forth, uh, and that's where you can probably find a way to win. And sure enough, this 
position was very interesting. They came in with a weakest link, and uh, we don't really have a good way to block it, so we just let it happen. They can have the Slithering Shadow Peed there. There is no way for them to uh, give the weakest link go again with Slither for them to potentially kind of punish um, punish uh, the fact that they draw a card at the end there. So yeah, we we'll just let them have it. They can have the Slither. At the, at the end of the day, it's another card in my graveyard, which is feels pretty good. Uh, and then we are now in a position where we can three card 12, which takes their entire hand, or flip redeemed. So I went with the Boneyard Monitor for a couple reasons here. First and foremost, we have room to just flip redeemed on the next turn, worst case. Regardless of what the graveyard looks like, we have room to do that, worst case. Best case, we draw into one of our power cards. Uh, we haven't seen any Art of Wars this game. I'm pretty sure this is a game where I didn't see any Art of Wars yet. So those are looking pretty likely. Or even a final Blood Rush. Uh, Blood Rush on this kind of last turn, which we're getting into at turn 10, feels pretty good. Because you get to just go Claw Claw into Flip Redeemed, which is massive. Absolutely massive. Uh, so that's what I thought we would end up doing on that last turn there and play a couple more hands out. But our opponent had um, a hand that, uh, yeah, just would have folded anyway to the damage presented. So it anyway, pretty... Pretty good game uh you can see against the new like it, it came down to really just like one good hedge block which sometimes you'll be incorrect about your hedge block that is fair uh and it came down to understanding um where mask of recurring nightmares can blow you out which uh you just don't want to let that happen if that happens good lord it feels terrible uh because you had more control over letting that be something that interacts with you or not uh but here we go we're gonna move on to the zen game and the Zen game, we're going to sideboard a little bit differently again. Uh, into new, we are running the hooves because I really value the graveyard fill. Uh, whereas into Zen, I normally run scab skins. Actually, I don't remember if I ship the hooves or not. I guess I ship the hooves. I guess I ship the hooves. The, you know what? This is actually, it makes sense. In my more recent testing against Zen, the only hit effect that ever comes up is the um, the tiger card that like can copy... Tiger Swipe, I think it's called. The one that like copies over all of the Crouching Tigers that you've played this turn. That's really the only card that has hit effect in Zen. So you can either just run like extra health in Scab Skins, or you can run like the on-demand push with Hooves of the Shadow Beast. Uh, so you know what? Actually, good good on you, uh, past Ethan, who ran, who played this game. Uh, because I, I think I do prefer Hooves into Zen specifically. Into the other ninjas, like Katsu, I don't think we can do that. Uh, into Katsu, you need to value the uh, mask, you need to value like the Katsu trigger, so those do demand uh, just more armor out of you, whereas Zen is just an upfront race more than anything. And it's also a race around like very specific points in the game, uh, because you can kind of tell when they're not going to kill you, is when they didn't block with Stride of Reposal. It's when they didn't block with Traverse the Universe. It's when they haven't even made a Chi yet. So they actually can play some turns uh, uh, like really slowly in the early game, just like kind of not do much. Uh, or they can try to kill you outright on like their big combo turn with Stride and Traverse. So with Hooves, you get a little bit more agency and just saying, I can force my hand to do something aggressive. Maybe they like fully blocked out because they just like weren't ready to go yet. Uh, or they just played like a relatively weak early game and you're just so far ahead that once again, like you want to just slam them with hooves. So I do like this choice here. Uh, we end up now with a blood rush that, uh, hey, this is two games back to back where we've had to lead with a red on the blood rush, but it's not like we're not going to play it, right? Especially in a first cycle type of game like this. Uh, so we ended up just going claw into slithering, which isn't going to get us wildly ahead, but what we like about this is we have Endless Mon Graveyard, which is a incredibly strong card for blocking a little bit of what our opponent is doing, coming back with what we want to do, and then arsling a piece that we are going to want into the next turn, right? That's how we're going to use our four cards most likely. One's going to pitch for Endless, one's going to block, and then one is going to go into Arsenal. Uh, so with the four blue draw, that's not exactly what we need to consider. It's something we can do. But we actually have a lot of ability to decide with this hand, uh, just because we could play the Soul Harvest if we really wanted to. Uh, we could play the Dread Screamer to, uh, into Diabolic if we wanted to. Uh, we could just do Smashback Elhorn into uh, Endless Maw, into Arsenal Diabolic. Also looks pretty good. Diabolic's quite good with an agility up. So 
Those are the two options open right now. We could smash back, play endless, arsenal diabolic, or we could just go dread screamer into diabolic right now. Uh, the choice on going dread into diabolic is more so because in this matchup in particular, diabolic has zero flexibility. Diabolic is going to get played uh, from Arsenal. It's never going to get blocked with from Arsenal, whereas in the last game against New, there have been strange edge cases where I have blocked with Diabolic from Arsenal off of an Art of War. Because that will never be the way we play this game, truly never, uh, I'm just deciding to keep the Endless Mon Arsenal instead of playing out the uh, three card 10 effectively. So it's a bit interesting because this deck is built to cycle out these one cost from arsenals a lot more consistently. Uh, you can see in this hand right here, we would have had a great time uh, just playing the Hungering Slaughter Beast into Diabolic off of the agility token effectively. Like that would have been a great turn and then even reset our arsenal with an Endless Maw. This hand would have played perfectly that way. Uh, it has other options. Of course, Endless Maw is always going to give us options in how we want to block down with these hands. So with two Endless Maws in play, uh, one in arsenal, one in hand, we can easily sequence together these two back to back turns. The one issue in doing it, uh, well, in playing it out in this exact moment is our graveyard is a little janky and it was going to be tough either way um, with the Dread Diabolic play or the Smashback play just because uh, we're adding non-sixes to our graveyard at the cost of sixes in our graveyard. So luckily we're not playing any like Shadow Realm Horrors yet to really worry about this, but we do want to worry about it in the capacity of uh, you know, caring at all about turning off Blood Debt, which luckily we're early in the game here, only two Blood Debt, so it's not win or lose on the Blood Debt miss. Uh, in fact, if we whiff on the first Endless Maw and just come in for a two card six, that basically guarantees that the second Endless Maw will still be a two card nine, and I think that will be salvageable. Honestly, I think we were we were in the clear, whether it's Endless Maw, Endless Maw, uh, whether they both hit or, you know, the first one misses, the second one hit, I think we are fine. We are fine to be in that position just because our blood debt is still low, uh, especially since our opponent, I think, messed up something here. They they end up with a Crouching Tiger in hand, which definitely can't be what they wanted to do because that card ends up, you know, getting stuck. They can't pitch it away. They can't do anything with it. Uh, so our turn is pretty good. We do banish three sixes, which is uh, enough for the Endless Mod to come in for nine. That is kind of the wrong order of whether or not we were going to whiff on three. We would have rather this one whiff and then the second one hit because now our next one does matter more with four blood debt at this point. Uh, so a little bit unlucky in that regard, but we are lucky in that our opponent just isn't really doing much. Uh, and we are like chaining together at least decent arsenals back to back to back. Uh, and then speaking of chaining things together, we draw into a beast within blood rush hand, uh, which is also got the option of either blocking with agile windup or just discarding it on our own turn. I've seen the Zen decks do some pretty disgusting things, even though I'm pretty sure our opponent is definitely uh, on the back foot. I mean, you can't argue with that. We have full we have full equipment up. They are behind us in life. Um, but the Zen decks, especially with kind of the um, uh, like when they go off with like blocking with Strides of Reprisal, blocking with Traverse the Universe, they put that all together in one turn. It can be, you know, upwards of 20 plus damage. Uh, and so I protect, I decided to protect the life just a little bit with blocking the agile windup instead of um, greeting and using it on my own turn to try to carry the agility over. Just because if there is going to be a way I lose this game, it's going to be off the back of the Zen actually having their insane pop off turn. Uh, and then don't forget, we also have Hose of the Shadow Beast. So even though we aren't carrying an agility into our next turn, we are carrying the option into our next turn of going. Uh, a bit wider than expected. Just with hooves on the table, we have that choice. So that's, man, that is some of the beauty of hooves, isn't it? Like we know already that we can force go again next turn without needing to play into the agile windup, uh, which is just a very cute way to save points here and there in a matchup. Because in a way, if you think about it this way, we lost two block. We lost two block by not taking scabskins in this matchup but we just gained a decision point that guaranteed us to life in this matchup and opportunities for more mind you with with how you can think about your hooves turns so yeah quite good quite good i think what's really pushing hooves uh, over the line for me over scabskins is um not just shadow realm horror um well hold up let's back up 
is mainly the build decisions around Shadow Realm Horror. I tried uh, not going all in on like the one cost count, uh, but one of the recent decisions I've been tinkering with in the list is running the Red Gravelings, which I initially had as Savage, Savage Feasts, but I really wasn't loving them. I was running into way too many clunky situations where my hand could just like get go again in too many ways, but the most consistent way was actually to just not discard at all. Even with agility and all that, the most consistent way for me to just do what I wanted was to not play out my Savage Feasts. So I swapped the Savage Feasts for the Red Gravelings right now, uh, which is still great for the Shadow Realm Horror Curve. It's even higher for that ceiling of a two card 14. Uh, and then it's also quite good when you are forcing plays with Hooves of the Shadow Beast, because now you're basically saying the action point I gain off of Hooves is probably gonna curve into me slamming now even more choices of one cost onto that turn. One of the other card choices you'll see that is kind of made around the similar thought processes is Yellow Hungering Slaughter Beast. There is a lot of agility in this list, and without Savage Feast, I was looking for the right card to use agility. And honestly, that comes down to Yellow Hungering Slaughter Beast. Yellow Hungering Slaughter Beast is enabling all these other one cost in the deck. Uh, it's enabling the Gravelings, the Diabolics, like the Boneyards, the Slytherings, all those just look so good next to a blue and a two cost card. So we're effectively running Yellow Hungering as a flexible card uh, that can pitch into other two cost plays that is good after drawing Blood Rush. Uh, it's just like blocking chaff better than a Mark of the Beast would because it actually ends up in your graveyard for playing your own Shadow Realm Horrors. Uh, and then critically, you know, it's unlocking that, uh, that curve. That curve that is so good for this two cost into one cost that Shadow Realm Horror wants so, so much. So. Here we go. Uh, this is another massive play. The Endless Maws have really been overperformers in this matchup, and they generally are. Oh, like, the smaller hands you get to play into Ninja, the better the games will look, right? If you can just slam Endless Maws nonstop, if you can slam, like, the three card plays nonstop, it just looks so good. You're valuing like crazy. And, uh, hey. This was pretty fun to go over, a bit of a ramble, but let me know if you would have done any of the plays differently, some of the things you've been trying in Leviah. Please join the Discord for all the conversations in the meantime, and I'll be working on the deck over the weekend to make sure that the deck tech is 100% ready for Monday. It, it.